let's see what I want to do and um, is uh, whoops I just made everything disappear here uh, is uh, I am going to start with um, three um, go back to lecture three do a quick rip through of a few things we started there and conclude um, lecture three with uh, what we didn't get to last time, which was just a brief discussion of the exponential decay law. I think mostly familiar to people, but just to reinforce these ideas. Uh, we talked about alpha decay. Um, remember total nucleon number must be conserved, i.e. the sum of protons and neutrons and charge must be conserved. Um, uh, this is the emission of an alpha particle, AKA helium-4 nucleus, typically five MeV, uh, <clears throat> half-lives uh, typically very, very long. Um, the, and uh, if you think of the um, chart of the nuclides as a chessboard, it moves you diagonally down. It's like a bishop, it moves you <laughs> diagonally, uh, but just two steps, uh, two diagonal uh, spaces. So two, proton, it two protons, two neutrons lighter of the parent nucleus. Uh, beta decay is a three-body process, um, <clears throat> and um, for the case of neutron-rich uh, nuclei, um, and because now there are an infinitude number of ways of sharing uh, momentum and energy uh, while conserving both, then you don't get sharp uh, spectral lines. You end up with a continuum uh, where the um, endpoint is the maximum energy that the electron could uh, take out in, the, in that particular case where the anti-neutrino, this ghostly like particle, which doesn't concern us terribly much in this course, <clears throat> Um, uh, goes to the limit of having uh, carrying away none of the energy. Here's an example we'll talk about a little bit later, carbon-14, which has a half-life of 5,730 years or 5,160 years. Carl, are you, are you uh, intending to share the slides? We don't actually have any slides. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Where is this? Sorry. Now, can you see it? Is it shared? Can you see that? Okay, thank you. All right, what's wrong with this thing here? I gotta get rid of this here. 10, 11 months, I'm still fumbling with this thing. Um, there we are. Good. Okay. Yes, so there's your alpha decay. Um, uh, what happens to the parent nucleus <clears throat> um, in um, the, the after alpha emission, two neutrons later, two protons later. Uh, beta decay, continuum spectrum, um, Typical energies, tens of kilovolts to hundreds of kilovolts to a few MeV. Um, beta decays um, um, <clears throat> can be very long lived, but very frequently are um, short lived, particularly if the mass difference between uh, the mother and daughter nucleus is large. Um, it can be um, microseconds, milliseconds, seconds. It can be quite quite fast. And here <clears throat> um, it, it moves diagonally um, uh, up and to the left. So one neutron converts into one proton, but the total uh, atomic weight remains the same. So this is uh, the uh, A equals 14 uh, isotopes, carbon 14 to nitrogen 14. Uh, gamma decay nuclei can be um, uh, when they are below the separation energy. They don't have enough energy to emit a proton or a neutron or anything else. Um, 
uh, will then need to uh, emit, um, to cool down by emitting gamma rays. Um, since there is a shell structure, uh, analogous to an atomic shell structure for atomic nuclei, um, these gamma rays are emitted um, since they are going between states of discrete energy, then the gamma rays that are emitted are going to be in discrete energies and they will show up as sharp, li sharp lines in a high resolution detector. Okay, and we talked about um, the stopping power or penetrating power of various radiation. Alpha decays uh, are benign unless um, they come into intimate contact with uh, you know, something with a, a mucous membrane, uh, the uh, lining of your lung, or it's ingested orally, uh, things like that. Uh, it can be very bad, of course, if you ingest heavy uh, metals, uh, actinides and things like that, which are alpha emitters and they get into your bone, then you are in, uh, that. that's a very serious situation and can be uh, cancer inducing. Uh, beta decay is more penetrating, but can normally be stopped by a thin sheet of metal. Gamma rays, depending on the energy, can be very penetrating, and the neutrons uh, very penetrating, but are um, most readily stopped with hydrogenous material, water, paraffin, whatnot. Okay, here's what we didn't get to last time, so this is new material. Um, <clears throat> so um, the um, this was, I think, you know, one of the I think mysteries of uh, you know that I think that ultimately was. Uh, solved with the advent of uh, the quantum mechanics in 1925, um, which um, uh, is the fact that you can have processes um, which are uh, random. And uh, we have the notion here of uh, uh, a half-life. Uh, the and general kind of rule in thumb and physics is that if there is no conservation law forbidding a transition from happening, conservation laws being energy, momentum, uh, angular momentum, uh, charge, and things like this, um, if something can happen, eventually will happen. And uh, people, in fact, are very convinced that the proton can decay, even though they've set an upper uh, or lower limit of like 10 to the 33, maybe 10 to the 34 years uh, for the decay of the proton. We haven't seen it. But in fact, uh, I think most serious physicists believe that protons ultimately can decay. Um, okay, it's a random. This business of the exponential decay law is a uh, is a law, quote unquote. Uh, it's a st probabilistic law. It, it, it is something which uh, pertains more and more accurately for a larger population of nuclei. And what it means to say the half life definition of half life is to say that um, uh, what time is it such that a very large sample of radioactive, for example, radioactive uh, nuclei um, will have, uh, half of them will have uh, done their thing, I emitted an alpha particle, emitted a beta particle, whatnot, fission, whatnot. Um, um, uh, so 50% uh, down the exponential decay curve is the definition of a half-life. Where does this come from? Well. Basically, um, the, uh, in any situation where you have uh, a large number of identical systems, uh, these systems can be atoms or, or um, uh, particles or whatnot, uh, such that the probability at any given small interval of time, um, the pro there's a, a fixed probability for the thing to have decayed or not decay, then in a large ensemble, you will have that the change in a small interval of time, delta n, will be minus, because you're, this is a loss, lambda, uh, which is a decay constant, times that number, delta t. Okay. Given that, that's the simplest type of differential equation you, you, um, you can conceive of almost. And um, if I integrate that, I get that the n will go down as uh, minus lambda t, like that. It's statistical, um, but the underlying uh, mechanism, the physics of it, is, is what determines the, um, the uh, what specifically that half-life is. Is it seconds? Is it uh, uh, billions of years? Okay. 
Um, um, I'm not going to show you these, but uh, I'm not going to show you the first one. I'll show you the second one. Um, but it turns out um, lots and lots of things in life, not simply um, uh, uh, you know, atoms, nuclei, and subatomic particles, uh, obey the exponential decay law. It turns out there have been scholarly articles written in uh, Swedish um, where they actually measured the exponential, uh, the half-life of uh, beer foam for various high quality beers that have a good head on them. So if you think you see thousands and thousands of these microscopic little bubbles, at any given second, the bubble may pop or not pop. Um, and that probability is not conditioned by how long the, the bubble has been around. Um, and, and so long as every individual uh, system, i.e. in this case, a, a bubble in the foam, um, has the same probability per second of popping or not popping, then a large ensemble of them will follow the uh, exponentially de uh, decay law. In fact, uh, I'll show you uh, a picture out of a scholarly journal. I think uh, it must have been done in, in, uh, with some tongue in cheek here. Uh, those, but those of you who read uh, Swedish can uh, understand this. But you, there you see the exponential decay curves for three different types of, uh, of beer. But let me go back here and um, just show you uh, um, a, nowadays, as you know, you can see lots and lots and lots of good pedagogical stuff on the web. And, um, and people in fact put entire kind of, uh, um, kind of uh, uh, micro courses on the web um, on their favorite topic. Um, this is the one that's done with uh, a relatively small number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, units, um, as you'll see. And when you get down to the limit of small um, numbers, then in fact, the, um, the, you get the exponential decay law, but it does, you'll actually see a lot of kind of statistical rattiness around it. Um, this one has to do with dice. Can this beanie hat protect my head from harmful 4G and 5G cell phone radiation? Oh, really? Okay. Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and this is AP Physics Essentials video 136. It's on half-life and radioactive decay. To model that, my daughter and I started rolling some dice. We had 32 dice in the cup. And what she would do is she would roll the dice, and then she'd pull all of a certain number out. So in this first simulation, she's going to pull all the ones out. And so you put those to the side. That's generation one, and now generation two, and generation three, and generation four. Now, when you get to the fourth generation, she's hit her first half-life. What does that mean? Well, if there were 32 to start, that's the amount of time it takes for half of those to decay. And so that would be 16. So 16 have decayed right here. So she's going to keep doing that. And so if we watch what happens in the rest of the simulation, you're not pulling as many dice because there's not as many left. And eventually they've all decayed after 19 generations. But what you can see is that the half-life is consistent. So this was to 16 and then to eight and then to four and then to two and then to one. And so radioactive nuclei will decay. What does that mean? They're gonna kick off some kind of a particle. It could be alpha, beta, or gamma. And then they're gonna form a new, usually more stable, nuclei. And so in this radioactive decay, mass and energy are conserved. We've talked about that in, in previous videos. But what we're going to talk about here is what is the probability of that decay occurring? Well, it's chance. So we never know when the next one's going to decay. But what we can use is the law of large numbers to calculate the half-life. The half-life is the amount of time it takes for half of the radioactive nuclei to decay. In other words, if this represents all of the radioactive uh, nuclei, that would be the time it takes for half of them to decay. Now we've got all these ones left. And so we'd have another half-life like that. And we can just keep going and going and going and going like that. And so there's an equation we can use to figure out how many are going to decay at each generation. And so delta N, which is the change in the radioactive nuclei. So N is going to be our radioactive nuclei. So the change in N is minus, because we're losing those nuclei. So negative decay constant, I'll get to that in a second, times N, which is 
is the number of radioactive nuclei times time. And so if we kind of work backwards for that, in this simulation here, our time was advancing one generation after another. And so that's going to be one each time. What was our decay constant? Well, it's one in six. So it's a one sixth probability that you're going to roll a one and that that one's going to decay. And so we could model that. I'll just use a quick little spreadsheet to do that. So at time zero, how many radioactive nuclei did we have? Well, our n value was 32. So let me walk you through this formula. What is our time going to be? It's going to be one. What's going to be our n value? It's 32. So 1 times 32. And then what's our decay constant? It's 1 sixth. And so it's going to be negative 1 sixth times 32. So what is that value? It's going to be negative 5.33. Now, if we look how many actually decayed, it's six, but it's close, negative 5.33. This is what it would predict to be, and this is what we actually got with a really small number of dice. Now, how do you do the next one? Well, what we have to do is we have to take that 32. These ones decayed, so we're going to take 32 minus 5.33, and that's my end value for the next generation. And so now what do I do? I go back to this formula again. So it's going to be t, which is one, times my new n, which is going to be 26.67 times my decay constant, which remains constant. And so what I'm going to get is negative 4.45. Now, how does that match up? Oh, it's pretty close to this. So then we subtract that value like that. And we could just do this over and over again. So right here on the right is going to be what we would predict to occur. And this is what actually occurred in this little simulation. And the number of dice are so small compared to the number of nuclei in a sample. But if you look at my data, the green line represents the actual data that we find. The red line represents the predicted. And so you can see that it matches up pretty quickly. What would happen if we changed the decay constant? What if we changed it from 1 6 to 1 half? So how would you do that in the modeling? And so instead of pulling 1s out, she's going to pull the 1s, 3s, and 5s out. So what's going to happen? Well, it's going to happen more quickly. So more of them are going to decay at each point, and so it's going to take less time for all of them to decay. In other words, our half-life has gotten much, much shorter. And so you should be able to calculate half-life. So how long would it be for half of them to decay? You can see it's going to be somewhere around four generations. And so when you look at a curve, the first thing you want to do is figure out how long does it take to go from 100 radioactive nuclei to 50% of that. And so if I look across here, it took one year for 50% of them to decay. So let's watch the next generation. So now we should go to 25. You can see it's consistent, one year, one year, one year. And so you could say for this, perfect model, it's going to be a half-life of one year. But on a test, you're more likely to get something like this. Calculate the half-life decay of carbon-14. So if you're given this curve right here, we go from 100 to 50. So you, you count across like that. So this is 50% of the carbon-14. And then you just read the time on the bottom. So if this right here is 10,000 years, what is our radioactive half-life? It's around 6,000 years. But let's keep going. So now let's go down to 25%, and you can see it's around 12,000. And so it's pretty consistent over time. Now, each form of radioactive decay is going to kick off a different particle. Let's start with alpha particle. An alpha particle is two protons and two neutrons. So if we look at the alpha decay of uranium-238, let's make sure that the mass is conserved. And so mass on the left side is 238. Mass on the right side is 238. So we're fine there. Let's make sure charge is conserved. 92 positive charge on the left, 92 positive charge on the right. So that's conserved as well. Now, what's the half-life of uranium-238 decay? It's 4.47 billion years. It takes a huge amount of time for just half of the uranium-238 to decay. But there's so many nuclei that we can actually measure this. And this is how we determine the age of the Earth. Let's look at beta decay. In beta decay, we convert a neutron to a proton. We also give off an electron and an electron antineutrino. So if we look across the top, mass is conserved, 14 and 14, and charge is conserved. On the left side, we've got one po six positive charges. On the right side, seven positive, one negative. And so we've got six positive charges on the right as well. What's the half-life of carbon-14 decay? It's going to be 5,730 years. So we had shown that just a few slides ago. It was a around 6,000 for a half-life. And we can use this to date living material. And then we could look at gamma decay. Remember in gamma decay, we're just giving off these gamma rays. We're going from baryon-137 that is charged to baryon-137 that's not charged. And so we're conserving charge and conserving mass. What's the half-life? 
2.6 minutes. So it's really, really short. And so half-life is going to change depending on that decay constant, but you should be able to take a graph like this, figure out the half-life, and I hope that was helpful. Good. Okay. There was a slip of the tongue near the end. He said something that's charged, uncharged. He meant excited to unexcited in the, in the barium there. Okay. Um, let's just talk a couple of specific cases. Um, uh, he um, talked about carbon-14 as a chronometer um, for um, uh, archaeologists and so forth. Um, a very uh, famous one is the decay of potassium-40. Uh, uh, it's an important geochronometer um, uh, with a about one and a quarter billion year uh, half-life and is very good for dating um, uh, uh, fossils and, uh, uh, and uh, the Earth's crust and so forth. Uh, just as a, um, uh, just as something to bring it home a little bit, uh, uh, some of you know, um, uh, in the uh, Echeverry Hall and in the, in the uh, our, uh, cavernous lab in the basement, uh, room 1140, we have a high flux neutron generator. Uh, we work closely with the Berkeley Geochronology Center there. Um, uh, it turns out a variant for looking at the decay of potassium 40 into argon 40, um, which was used uh, to great advantage to learn lots of things. It was even used on the Mars rover to uh, look at the age of uh, the certain uh, areas of the crust on Mars uh, as well. It, it turns out uh, when you put these things through a mass spectrometer, um, there are large errors associated with the fact that one of these things is a metal and the other is a noble gas. In the mid 1970s, um, I'm forgetting who did it, uh, but there was a great breakthrough. Someone had the bright idea of saying, look, since in the solar system, the ratio of potassium 39 to potassium 40 um, is constant to a high degree. We can transmute potassium 39 into argon 39 um, using neutrons. And um, then you can just look at argon 39 and argon 40, which are chemically identical, just only different in mass. And in a mass spectrometer, we'll talk about a mass spectrometer shortly, um, all the systematic errors, the common errors cancel out in the numerator denominator and one can get much, much more accurate measurements. Um, we just recently, a couple of years ago, published the first paper ever where a, uh, a, a neutron generator was used to do dating of, um, ver of uh, uh, crustal samples uh, known of known age, including um, the, um, the Vesuvian lava from 79 AD that was uh, uh, described by Pliny the Younger, chronicled by Pliny the Younger, and we were getting these ages spot on from, you know, uh, thousands of years to 30 million years. Uh, up until this point, anybody who wanted to do what's called argon-argon dating had to send their samples to a reactor, for example, up at Oregon State, but now we can do these things in the uh, uh, more rapidly uh, in our own uh, laboratory. Um, here is um, uh, uh, what uh, Professor Anderson was talking about, carbon-14 dating. And you say, well, why, uh, how does this work, by the way? Uh, where does this carbon-14 come from, um, given that the, um, um, you know, given uh, that, uh, although 6,000 years is a long time, um, uh, in fact, carbon-14 is, uh, will actually, in um, several half-lives will actually be gone completely. Um, and uh, the, the answer is that it's constantly being replenished in the atmosphere by cosmic rays. So these very high energy protons or atomic nuclei come zipping into the atmosphere, hit an oxygen or hit a uh, nitrogen nucleus, um, giving out a shower of particles. And then fast neutrons will hit car ni uh, uh, nitrogen 14 neutron in, proton out, and you've got carbon-14. So the clock starts at that point. Um, it's rapidly mixed in the atmosphere, and it is taken up in uh, CO2, uh, just like uh, all other CO2 uh, molecules in the air, uh, by vegetation, by plants, grass, algae on the ocean, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, so anything in the living ecosystem is constantly having, uh, is taking in carbon of a, um, a specific fraction of carbon 14 to carbon 12. And I'm, tr I'm forgetting the number, but it's, I think it's 10 to the minus 12 or 10 to the minus 15, something on that, uh, uh, in that range. Um, and that stays in steady state so long as you are uh, uptaking things which derive, you know, either vegetables or things which derive from vegetables. It's one of my colleagues, you know, uh, used to taunt me when I would show up at lunch with a salad and he said, that's not food, that's what food eats. But whether you're eating beef or you're eating salad, you're getting the same fraction of carbon-14. When you die, um, then the next clock starts, which is um, the carbon-14 starts decaying away and the ratio of carbon-14 to um, uh, total carbon goes down. And if you measure that very accurately, you, you know how many half-lives ago this person or this thing uh, fell out of equilibrium with the rest of the eco ecosystem. Um, and this was uh, Willard Libby at Chicago who invented this in the 1940s, uh, won the Nobel Prize for it in 1960 because it's become an incredibly useful tool for uh, dating, uh, uh, dating things. Um, it became more complicated after the early 1960s um, when we did, the US and Russia did uh, huge amounts of, of above ground nuclear testing, atmospheric nuclear testing that threw up all kinds of radioactive species into the atmosphere. A lot of it decayed away, but the carbon-14 um, uh, takes a long time to decay away. And there is a little correction factor um, having to do uh, with things prior to, uh, that you measure, in fact, most things prior to, uh, uh, to the 1960s. Now, here's something at the bottom of the slide that's very important. Um, the, um, the half-life is, um, uh, goes like one over lambda, but it's log two. So it's, it's a, a 0 0.693 divided by the decay constant, or put differently, the decay constant, um, uh, the number of uh, disintegrations per second is 0.693 divided by the half-life. Okay, and that is that. And I'm going to now scroll up the next slide on the topic. And when I finish a slide deck, uh, finish a particular lecture, I make a PDF and then put that up in B courses. So uh, I um, uh, wasn't uh, neglecting you. It's uh, after the last lecture, but I wanted to finish that lecture before making the PDF and putting it up on uh, B course. Any questions or shall we move on? Okay, so let's see. We started at 2.10 and I want to turn the um, podium over to Professor Nock in about 12 minutes, but let's get started on nuclear fission. Um, <clears throat> the history is fascinating, and uh, Professor Nock, I think, mentioned a lot of this already. Uh, this was December of 1938. Uh, for a long time, the chemists um, had reported, but I think not um, put themselves out forcefully, you know, I, you know submitting for publication. Um, they had seen evidence that uh, with uh, uh, actinides, with uranium, um, and uh, I believe thorium as well, they'd seen evidence <clears throat> that when they did chemical analysis of the sample, um, that they would um, find uh, medium weight nuclei, even after the uranium had been chemically purified. And they said, where, what process on earth could possibly give rise to this? And people said, well, chemistry, this is a, 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 a grimy business. You clearly have are dealing with contamination. There's no physics here. There's no, and it was all driven by a prejudice that there was no way that you could uh, go, uh, the no decay process known to them by which you could go from a very heavy nucleus um, in mass uh, 230 range, 238, down to um, something which was uh, uh, in the um, range of uh, uh, 90 to 140. But they kept seeing evidence for uh, nuclei like barium, krypton, xenon, and so forth. Finally, 
um, um, sort of uh, Hans Strassmann and Meitner finally said, no, there's no getting around it. We've done everything very carefully. We don't quite know what the process is, um, but um, uh, we are convinced that this process going on, I think they may have used the word fission at that point. Um, as Professor Nock mentioned, uh, Meitner um, uh, was Jewish and uh, in the late uh, 30s um, decided it was prudent to go to Sweden to get out of Germany and therefore was not there at the time of the publication, but she had very good theoretical abilities and actually came up with the picture of how fission happens. No one could quite see how a large nucleus could can go into um, a, a lighter nucleus. And she's the one that had the kind of mental picture based on what was called the liquid drop model uh, where the thing would, um, would kind of neck down and the Coulomb repulsion would drive the two fragments apart. So it was a, um, a barely stable object held in by surface tension, but due to the enormous Coulomb force of this nucleus, it really did want to, um, uh, to become uh, two medium weight nuclei. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, so, and there was um, Otto Frisch, who in fact was the nephew. He played an important role in the story. Uh, he was the nephew, in fact, of Lisa Meitner. Um, <clears throat> so that was in fact the, the thing what they published. Um, evidence for uranium plus a slow neutron going into barium plus uh, krypton. Um, so the Z of the fission uh, products being in the 30 to 60 range. Okay. Um, as uh, um, as uh, Professor Nacht also mentioned, a person who played a very important role historically here was Leo Szilard, uh, a brilliant Hungarian um, uh, mostly a theorist um, who came to the United States in the 1930s, who holds a surprising number of patents on things which he never built, but he actually had the mental idea for how to build a linear accelerator before there was a linear accelerator um, and mass spectrometers. Uh, he actually patented the idea that uh, once the neutron was discovered that perhaps uh, there were nuclear processes uh, by which a neutron would go in and multiple neutrons would go out. And he actually patented this, even though he did not know of a specific nuclear process that would fulfill this requirement. Um, and, but he, he's a person that was quite visionary and understood the, the, the uh, significance of things. Um, and, and uh, you know, before other people could, could understood their significance. And he was the one that did travel out um, to Montauk um, on Long Island uh, to secure um, Einstein's signature for a letter to send to Roosevelt after it was discovered that the Germans uh, had discovered fission. And there were uh, clear traces that I think there, there were clear pieces of evidence they were proceeding with a bomb program. Um, just to show you something rather interesting here from the Army um, intelligence office, um, as happened with so many of the people who were actually fleeing from oppression in Germany, they were they themselves were suspected. This is a, uh, a document here uh, talking about Enrico Fermi um, and Mr. Zillard, <laughs> Dr. Zillard, um, where uh, it, uh, it says that Enrico Fermi says uh, he is supposed to have left Italy because of the fact that his wife is Jewish, he has been a Nobel Prize winner, his associates like him personally and greatly admire his intellectual ability. He is undoubtedly a fascist. Uh, it is suggested that before implying him on matters of a secret nature, much more careful investigation be made. Employment of this person on secret work is not recommended. <laughs> Good heavens. You know, I don't think we would have succeeded with the Manhattan Project without Enrico Fermi. Ditto with Szilard, the, almost the, um, um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it says it is understood that his family were wealthy merchants in Hungary and were able to come to the United States with most of their money. He is an inventor and is stated to be very pro-German and to have remarked on many occasions that he thinks the Germans will win the war. Same thing is suggested before employing on matters of a secret nature, a much more careful investigation be made. Employment of this person on secret work is not recommended. Um, boy, were they getting these things wrong here. Um, okay. 
uh, Zillard was a little bit of a gadfly. He did not have a regular position, but he had I, lots of ideas and were kind of float around and and made things happen. I mean, which was his great, great genius. Uh, you know, he didn't have to do the experiments himself, but he actually convinced people to get moving and uh, to put his ideas into, into motion. Now, here is the letter um, that Professor Knox spoke about. Um, uh, August 2nd, 1939, Old Grove Road, Nassau Point, Peconic, Long Island. Uh, F.D. Roosevelt, President of the United States, uh, begins, sir. And then he begins to talk about the recent history of the discovery of fission, uh, the work of uh, Joliot in France, Fermi Soulard in, in America, the possibility of a nuclear sustained reaction. Um, and then very circumspectly, he said, it is conceivable that if, if a, if a uh, chain reaction can be made to work, you could make a bomb. And um, he uh, opines that um, <clears throat> uh, uh, the bomb uh, most likely would be carried into a port uh, by a boat, destroying the entire region around it. Um, possibly uh, could be delivered by air, by airplanes, but he said it may well prove too heavy. Um, it turns out the first bombs, as you will see later on in the course, were very heavy. They were on the order of, of four to five tons. Um, but uh, in fact, the B-29s at the time were able to, to do the job. Then he goes and talks about the posture of the United States in uranium. Um, uh, it says the US, we only have very poor ores, uh, but he talks about Canada and the former Czechoslovakia. Uh, more, most important source, uh, Belgian Congo. Um, and then he goes A and B. He goes, you know, uh, he recommends to the president to, um, uh, to apprise uh, various government departments about this um, and try to get things into motion here. And then B, experimental uh, work, uh, <clears throat> talking about limited budget to university laboratories. And he, he kind of respectfully urges uh, that. Uh, Private individuals be brought in uh, to this. Um, the um, uh, for and which in fact was uh, Alfred Loomis, very famous financier, who bankrolled a lot of in the early part of the war of both the microwave radar project and and the Manhattan Project as well, um, getting industrial labs involved, and then um, dangles something out there to, you know, to maybe perhaps alarm uh, the president talking about how uh, the Germans have um, uh, no longer allow sale of uranium from the uh, Czechoslovakian mines. Um, and that uh, Karl von Weizsäcker, who was a very famous nuclear physicist, who was the son of, who personally was later the president of Germany, the German undersecretary of state, um, is involved with the Kaiser Wilhelm suit in doing this kind of research. He doesn't browbeat the president, but I think a word to the wise is sufficient. And Roosevelt got moving initially, tentatively at first, but then later on, they, they really uh, uh, decided that it was time to, uh, after Pearl Harbor, to really put this thing into uh, high gear. Interesting letter, so you should study that. OK, some important historical details. And I think after talking about Alfred Neer, um, before we get into the technical aspects, uh, let me go on a couple of more minutes. Um, <clears throat> um, we'll just give you a little bit more really interesting and important. Uh, Nier was a son of German immigrants, um, uh, grew up in Minnesota, um, attended university there, went to grad school at Harvard, was one of the premier um, uh, people in the development of mass spectrometry. He was a major figure in developing um, uh, these devices which could separate out uh, species of very, very small differences in mass. And, um, and a lot of, in fact, his uh, measurement of the ratio of masses of, ver of the isotopes of uranium um, and other species led to the, um, you know, to the, 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 the best dates that we had of the age of the earth being about 4.55 billion years old. And uh, by this time it was known that uranium had uh, two components to it, um, um, uh, uranium-238 and, and uranium-235. 
Uh, it was not known um, at what uh, at the, uh, which was fissionable. Um, <clears throat> the uh, in fact another piece of interesting history I may or may not have mentioned, but um, a person I knew he was in fact a protege of Ernest Lawrence. Um, the uh, um, Oh, God, Louis Alvarez. I, when I was a postdoc, he was still in evidence up at the lab. He was holding court at lunch every day. Very famous guy, Nobel laureate and so forth. Um, he was, in fact, in the chase plane or the, the plane behind the Enola Gay, which dropped the first bomb on Japan, uh, that did the measurements and the photography of the, 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 the bomb damage afterwards. But he was a Jack of all trades, experimentalist. Uh, he he did so many incredible things in his lifetime in particle physics, nuclear physics, um, geology, everything. Um, his son was a very famous professor here as well. Um, and apparently, he was down on uh, Shattuck Avenue getting his hair cut in 1938 and uh, or 39, and uh, the. Uh, 38. I, and then uh, uh, apparently uh, Robert Serber came into the barber shop and said, did you hear the news? Han and Strassman have demonstrated uh, that this, it's uh, fission by slow neutrons of uranium. And apparently he went running out of the barber shop. I hope he paid the barber with his head uh, undone, completely went right up to the cyclotron and uh, very quickly produced a moderated uh, source of slow neutrons irradiated a thin uh, uranium sample in front of a Geiger Muller uh, detector and the thing went crazy and they, they started seeing very large signals, very, very large signals uh, with hundreds of, uh, indicative of hundreds of MeV energy release. And people were slapping their heads saying, how could we be so stupid to have not seen this? Anyway, the $64 question is, it was known that 235 was a minority fraction, 0.7%. Uranium-238 was 99.3%. Um, for obvious reasons, it became terribly important to understand which of these, or perhaps both of these, undergoes the fission uh, uh, on absorption of slow neutrons. <clears throat> and um, so Fermi suggested that Near separate out a small sample and send it to John Dunning at Columbia University at the cyclotron there. And um, so, um, the, this thing here, this little crook-shaped object is an evacuated, uh, is a tube that can be evacuated. Uh, and you may say, what's, the, what's this? It's a semicircle. Well, um, here is a, a photograph here of the ion source. You can actually see these little uh, heaters. Uh, they're electrical heaters sort of daisy chained together. Um, and there, there's a little oven in here where there is a um, uranium source. Um, here is um, a, a, a um, cathode. This is held at a very high voltage, some, um, some tens of thousands of volts. Here you can see a very small slot. The idea is, is to get a beam going out here, get all the ions, uh, or, uh, the positive charge. A few of these things in the uranium vapor, hot vapor will be singly charged um, coming out here. And um, uh, they will all have the same energy very importantly, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, and this thing is placed inside a transverse magnet such that charged particles travel around in a circular orbit like this. And uh, over here, he has a little foil catcher. And this thing is just a very, very thin strip of, uh, uh, it was kind of sheet steel. And uh, this thing was put in here and the, the spectrometer was turned on, they turned on uh, the heat, they turned on the voltage, waited a long time, and after a while they took this thing out, and on this very tiny piece of foil, uh, there were two little stains separated by a few millimeters, um, indicating that um, you had, um, here on the next slide, I'll show, um, um, 238 on the um, uh, uh, on the outer orbit, 235 in the inner orbit. Since they both have the same energy, the one with the smaller mass has the small momentum, the larger mass, the larger momentum, but the radius of curvature goes like the momentum. So this is how you separate out, spatially separate out two species, which are uh, elementally the same, but have are isotopically different like this. 
And so he put it in an envelope and mailed it to New York. Uh, Dunning got it, uh, it, sort of cut the foil down the middle between the two little stains, um, moderated the neutrons, put it up there, put up the 238, nothing, put up the 235 and the geiger muller uh, tube went wild. This was a good news, bad news story. Um, imagine the history of the world if uh, any uh, tiny country uh, with a few kilograms of uranium and a, uh, a crazy despot for a leader, you know, Luxembourg or Monaco could make an atomic bomb and uh, hold their, uh, their neighbors at risk. Thank heavens, it was the tiny component that uh, takes immense amounts of work and amounts, amounts of funding uh, to separate. Um, now, you still have a situation where a very large number of technologically sophisticated countries can spend a lot of money and uh, hold the rest of the world at risk. Uh, but thank heavens, it wasn't the 238 that was visionable. Um, uh, Carl? I, I'm going to quit. Oh, are you, are yeah. you giving me the Are you giving me the hook? I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. I just. But yeah. But yes. Thank you. All right. Questions. If not, I'll turn it over to Professor Knock. I'll give some interesting local history uh, when we're finished at, at the uh, next next lecture. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Van Bibber. Fascinating. Uh, let me just add a brief uh, bibliographical footnote to what he said. He talked about a man named Alfred Loomis. And Loomis was this uh, fabulously wealthy Wall Street financier, very interested in scientific and technological developments. And he had an estate in Tuxedo Park, mm -hmm. like uh, a formal, formal evening wear tuxedo, T-U-X-E-D-O Park, which was an estate in P near Poughkeepsie, New York. It's about an hour or hour and a half drive from New York City. And uh, he set up basically a lab which did path-breaking work both on the atomic bomb and on radar. He was actually the earliest funder of radar before the government funded radar. Anyway, if you're interested, it's a fascinating account in a book by uh, Jeanette Conant, mm -hmm. a relative of uh, the former Harvard president called Tuxedo Park, a Wall Street tycoon and the secret palace of science that changed the course of World War II. It's an amazing story and I highly recommend it. It's gripping, Tuxedo Park. Okay. I'm returning back to the immediate post-war world, World War II world. Uh, so last time you stopped here. I stopped here, so I'll just repeat again briefly that, uh, you know, Roosevelt initially had thoughts that perhaps the Russia, the Soviets would withdraw from Eastern Europe after there would be free elections in these countries of Eastern Europe, Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, Bulgaria, Romania, but instead uh, Stalin wanted to occupy these countries with the, with the Red Army and to establish uh, communist governments that were not elected but were appointed by Stalin. And uh, so after those, uh, those summit meetings that we talked about in Yalta and Potsdam in 45, in 46 already, Churchill, who was out of office, he had been defeated in his reelection campaign in 45, was invited to give a speech at Westminster College, a small college in Missouri, in which he uh, coined for the first time the Iron Curtain. And the most quotable line in the speech related to the map on the right is from Stettin in the Baltic up above there near the Baltic uh, Sea to Trieste in the Adriatic down below. An iron curtain, that's the red line across the middle of Europe, has descended across the continent. And this iron curtain was a dividing line between 
the territory controlled by the Red Army and the countries of Western Europe, which all became, uh, they were originally occupied by the US and the British and the French and Canadians, but those forces all withdrew and they became all sovereign democratic states. Uh, but that Iron Curtain lasted from 1946 until uh, really the collapse of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. So over 40 years, the Iron Curtain held. Next. The main uh, debate, which we discussed briefly, I think, uh, about US policy toward the Soviet Union was crystallized by George Kennan. Kennan had been the uh, he had been the deputy chief of mission in the U.S. embassy in Moscow after the war, and he knew Russia very well. He had served there since the '30s, and uh, he wrote a uh, very prominent article. Uh, he couldn't use his own name because he was still a foreign service officer and a State Department figure. It was called the X article in Foreign Affairs, major journal in 1947, called the Sources of Soviet Conduct. But it was really a plan for how, what US policy should be toward the Soviet Union after the war and with the Iron Curtain. And the most quotable line of that article is, United States policy must be that of a long-term patient, but firm and vigilant containment of Russian expansive tendencies. Basically, Kennan believed that the whole Russian structure with the communist regime could only survive if, if it continued to expand territorially. And, uh, and um, in order to stop that, if one could thwart that expansion, Kennan believed that ultimately Russian government and policies would have to be modified and moderated. That triggered a whole debate on what does really containment mean, what's involved, how does it work, and so forth. And you know, this was a, a policy that was debated throughout the Cold War in the 1970s in Vietnam. Vietnam was justified uh, as a application of containment. So sometimes it was uh, successful, sometimes it wasn't. Next. Now, uh, this led and was related to uh, the highlighting of the policy of deterrence as a central feature of US national security policy. Before that, it had never really had that prominence. Uh, here is a brief definition of it. And then I'll give you an example, a hypothetical example from myself. Um, I'm asserting here that the elements of deterrence between two bodies, A and B, they could be two countries, they could be labor and management, they could be husband and wife, uh, just two different entities. There are five main features to deterrence. The first is that A has to threaten B, that if B commits a certain action, call it X, A will punish B. It's a conveyance of a threat from A to B. B does not want, uh, A does not want B to commit the action. It must be uh, the case that B receives the threat. And in international relations and in uh, the complicated world of today, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, um, for example, uh, years later, uh, some Americans went to visit uh, Hanoi and asked them about uh, Johnson's policy of bombing the North Vietnamese to the conference table. And the North Vietnamese said, we never even knew about that policy. So, you know, when you're involved in policy making, you think everyone else knows about it, but it's not necessarily the case. So B, receiving the threat is a very important condition. B then calculates, remember B is the recipient of the threat. B 
calculates that A has the will and the capability to carry out the threat. Whereas will plus capability equals credibility. That is the threat from uh, A to B must be credible in the minds of B. B then calculates that the punishment received from A from receiving the, uh, the threat, I see punishment is misspelled there, exceeds the gain from taking the action X and chooses not to take the action X. So, you know, you're going to act, then you receive a threat, you just do cost benefit analysis, decide it's not worth it, and you don't act, then you have been deterred. And if it's true reciprocally, if both A and B each convey a threat to the other and neither side chooses to act, this is a condition of mutual deterrence, which is basically the story of the US Soviet and US Russian nuclear relationship. Any questions just about the bullets and the definition before I give you an example? Is it clear? It's pretty straightforward, but Mansuk, any questions from the audience? Uh, still no question in the chatting box. Okay, so let me give you an example. This is totally hypothetical, but it can uh, crystallize the uh, situation. Um, I had a son, I still have a son, his name is David. This example goes back many years when he was eight years old. He's now uh, married, has two grown children and so forth, but it started when he was eight years old. And let's hypothetical say, hypothetically say that David was not doing well in school, which is not the case. But let's say he was not doing well in school and we agreed that he would always do his homework before he turned on the television when he came home from school. Homework before television. Well, one day I finished work early and came home and went into what is, used to be called a family room, which was a room in a house that had a TV. And it was only 3.30 in the afternoon so David hadn't been home from school very long. And I found him walking toward the television. Now, this is a day also before there were uh, remote control devices. You had to go literally and turn on the TV by turning a switch, by pulling a knob or something like that. So it looked to me, the TV's off. David's heading toward the TV. And I say to him, David, if you turn on the television, I'll break your arm. I'll break your arm. Now, what's happening there? I've threatened David. I don't want him to turn on the TV. And I, I'm threatening to punish him if he does. It's a pretty small room, so it's pretty clear that David received the threat. Now, David, David's eight years old. He has to calculate, does his father have the will and the capability to carry out the threat? Probably David agrees that he, I have the will, I have the capability to carry out the threat. But does he think I have the will to carry out the threat? Would I likely break his arm if he turned the TV on? Is my threat credible? What do you think? It would be based on the history of your relationship. Well, I, I've never turned, I'd never broken his arm before. So probably not? Probably not. Uh, I think most people would say that an eight-year-old boy when given a threat like that would not believe that his father would actually carry it out. It would not be credible. David has to calculate that the punishment he received from, uh, from court, taking the action, which would be breaking his arm, would have seen the gain of watching TV for a minute or two. And he would choose not to take the action. Now, a, a key question here is the proportionality of the threat. Is it really uh, closely aligned to the action that's being deterred? For example, supposing there was a, a thief who was climbing through the window and he looked like he was gonna steal the television. And I said to him, if you touch the TV, I'll break your arm. 
How many of you would think that that's a more credible threat than a threat to David? Yep. Yeah, much more proportional. This was a serious uh, 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 robbery uh, threat. So a lot of deterrence is psychological. It's about judgments about will and capability. Capability you can somehow measure, but will is more psychological. So do you understand now the core elements of deterrence and a mutual deterrence and the necessity that B has to receive the threat and B has to decide not to take the action and if A and B are both in the same situation, it's mutual deterrence. Is it clear? This became a core element of US national security policy as the nuclear age evolved, starting in the late 1940s. And it still is to this day. Okay, next uh, slide. Okay, so now, um, Continue. There were several major figures who became civilian strategists trying to understand the importance of nuclear weapons and national security. And the first of prominence was Bernard Brody, a political scientist who received a PhD in political science at University of Chicago on naval power. But he was captivated by the bombs in Japan and he edited and co-authored a book that's to the right there. This is the first book on nuclear policy, The Absolute Weapon, Atomic Power and World Order. And Brody's main point was these weapons were so fantastically destructive that they should never be used, ever. They can be used to coerce, they can be used for political purposes, but they can't actually be used as they were in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This triggered a major debate in the academic community and a little bit in the governmental community about under what conditions should nuclear weapons be used. The military did not play much of a part in it. It basically tried to build up nuclear weapons and be ready to use them in case they were authorized to do so. The first major doctrine of US nuclear strategy came in the Eisenhower years Eisenhower, of course, had been the great hero of the Normandy invasion and the defeat of Germany in World War II. And he then became president of Columbia University and he ran for president in 1952 and was elected. And in 1953, his, Eisenhower was appointed Secretary of State, John Forster Dulles, a Wall Street a lawyer, coined the term massive retaliation. And what Dulles meant by that was, we were very concerned about uh, Soviet aggression at the time. 53 was a deep cold of the Cold War. And Dulles was essentially saying that if the Soviet Union it, it has incursions in any country, it could be in a small Asian country, that we would massive retaliate against the uh, Soviet population centers massive retaliation. This was immediately greeted by skepticism by the American intellectual and academic community that paid attention to this. So they base, just basically said, according to the bullets we had on the early definition of deterrence, that the threat was not credible. If the Soviets went into uh, Afghanistan or even Iran, some other country on their border, that uh, that uh, it seems totally implausible that the United States would attack Moscow, killing millions of people. Um, so uh, there was a debate in the 50s about what would be a replacement for massive retaliation. And this was uh, ultimately filled by Kennedy when he came into office in 1960, JFK and he has uh, selected Robert McNamara, a Berkeley grad and Harvard MBA, who had risen to become president of the Ford Motor Company in his 30s, very smart guy. And McNamara developed the uh, concept of assured destruction, 
saying that we need the capability to survive an initial attack, but then retaliate massively against Soviet population and industrial and military targets. And that would dissuade the Soviets from ever attacking us because they knew whatever they did, however know how much damage they caused us, we would reciprocate with a gigantic amount of damage against them. And then uh, theorists later noted that if assured destruction was reciprocal, that we could destroy them in a retaliatory attack and they could destroy us in a retaliatory attack, that what we had was mutual assured destruction, a condition of mutual assured destruction or MAD, which was a bit of a uh, humorous uh, aside to the gruesome possibility. Okay. Uh, Professor, yes. If possible, uh, would you also explain the concept of a flexible response? Yes. Uh, so McNamara also talked about a related concept that uh, we shouldn't just rely on massive nuclear responses. The world was much more complex than that. There were large numbers of conventional forces. The Soviets had a big conventional advantage. And what we needed to have was a variety of weapon systems, nuclear and conventional, that could respond at different levels up the escalation ladder to deter Soviet aggression. And actually he was uh, the uh, advocate of placing large numbers of small yield tactical nuclear weapons in Europe. And while McNamara was Secretary of Defense because the Soviets had a big conventional advantage in Europe and wanted to deter an attack by them in Western Europe, particularly into West Germany, that we had ultimately about 8,000 tactical nuclear weapons in Europe and they, would, and they could be used at different levels, different levels of destructive power. And uh, this was intended to show that we had an ability to respond flexibly irrespective of the type of initial Soviet attack. Okay, let's move on. Now over the years, and some of you might be familiar with this, others less so, uh, the US developed an, a, an arsenal, a suite of different kinds of ways to deliver the weapons. I'm not talking about the weapons themselves, which were mostly high yield weapons, but we got big time into different kinds of launch vehicles or delivery vehicles for the weapons. The first were the long range bombers, like the B-29 Super Fortress that's on the left, and that was the bomber that delivered the bombs on, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Later uh, replaced by the B-52 Strato Fortress, and the B-52 was still in our arsenal, and it's like seventh or eighth different uh, configuration. B-52 was deployed by around 1960, and it's 60 years later, it's still in the arsenal. And there's the uh, most recent B-21 radar Raider, and there also was the B-1 and the B-2. B-1 is no longer in the nuclear uh, war plans, but B-2 is. So a variety of different kinds of uh, manned bombers move slowly across the uh, continental US and the Pacific. Uh, they have the advantage of flexibility. They can be recalled. They can be sent to alternative targets. So that's one element of what became known as the nuclear triad. In addition, we developed intercontinental ballistic missiles or ICBMs. Uh, the mainstay of which was the Minuteman missile, land-based missiles in hardened underground silos in the Dakotas and Western states. And if you've ever had a chance to uh, visit a, a, a missile silo field, I've had that chance. You find that you come up in a flat area to a marine guarded post you get out of the bus, go into the uh, post, go down a deep, uh, an elevator very far down. And then uh, there are 
metal silo doors that open guarded by Marines and you are in a control room and there are uh, electronic controls for the Minuteman and uh, there are usually two Minuteman officers now could be men and women, young men and women in their early 20s. And they are drilled to a train to coordinate if necessary, a uh, the turning of two keys, each has a separate key, they have to turn their key simultaneously. And that can launch the missile. That would be after they receive coded messages that are authenticated that this was not the phony. So the two key system for Minuteman launches uh, and the ICBMs, the second key element of the nuclear triad to go with the bombers. And they've been involved a long time now. These are hardened, deeply buried uh, missiles in underground silos. Um, and finally, Next slide. Uh, a little bit later, they developed third, a third leg of the triad, submarine launch ballistic missiles, SLBMs, and they are deployed, they're physically on nuclear powered submarines or SSBNs, subsurface ballistic nuclear submarines the first of which were 41 submarines, each carried 10 missiles. And there's a, a, a photo in the left side of a, of a missile launched from a submarine underwater and it's uh, headed toward a, a Soviet target. The missile went through an evolution of carrying different kinds of warheads. Originally, they were called reentry vehicles, RVs. So bombs in a metal housing. Then the metal housing could carry multiple RVs. Then they could carry multiple independently targetable RVs. And now they can carry maneuverable reentry vehicles. So it's RVs, MRVs. MIRVs and MARVs. And if you do some calculations, you can show that with a MIRV, you have a chance, a high probability of destroying targets. You can put multiple warheads on a single target. Okay. And the Soviets have a similar configuration and Chinese are headed down the same direction. Next. Uh, McNamara, there he is on the right, the eighth Secretary of Defense, Kennedy's secretary, and then after Kennedy was killed, he stayed on and he was Johnson's secretary until Johnson eased him out after the failures in Vietnam. Uh, there is a formula for single shot kill probability if you want to uh, have uh, an attack using one or more reentry vehicles. One of the concerns in such an attack using MIRVs is that if you're not careful, the explosive device of one warhead could destroy another incoming warhead. That's called fratricide. You don't want to have that happen. You want to have one and then the other a warhead get through. In addition, uh, starting in the uh, 70s and 80s, we had an, an added element to the triad, which are cruise missiles. These are slow, slow flying, low altitude, highly accurate systems that are powered throughout their flight. Notice the ICBM and the SLBM these fly a ballistic trajectory. They go up into the atmosphere and then they come down 
by gravitational forces to their target. The alkum and the slickum and the glickum, which are air launched, sea launched or ground launched cruise missiles are, are powered directly from launch point to target. Um, and they added the, uh, they buttressed the capability, the military capability that McNamara wanted for assured destruction. Any questions about this? Okay, next slide. We also have air defenses and missile defenses. Air defenses are designed to produce, reduce the bomber penetrability. You don't want the bombers to get through. So the Russians have a very vast uh, network of air defenses, missiles designed to knock down the bombers. Missile defenses had their own evolution. And by the early 1960s, the Soviets built their first system around Moscow to defend Moscow from a missile attack. The US responded with its own safeguard and sentinel systems. But then various intellectuals and ultimately McNamara began to believe that defenses were destabilizing. Destabilizing is a term you'll often see in nuclear materials. It meant to destabilize is having an incentive to strike first. And what McNamara argued was that if one, if both sides have offensive capability and one side starts to build defenses, the other side would think that the side building defenses was preparing to strike and to use the defenses to protect against a, a retaliatory attack. So in 1967, there was a summit meeting in Glassboro, New Jersey with Johnson Lyndon Johnson and Alexei Kosygin, who was the uh, the head of the government of the Soviet Union, not the same as Brezhnev, but Kosygin came. And in that meeting, Kosygin said, defenses are destabilizing, you have to be crazy. We lost 20 million people in the Second World War. They can only be protective. And McNamara said, let me show you when he gave a two hour lecture to the Russians on why defenses could be destabilizing. Uh, move along. This led to uh, the uh, first uh, arms control agreement, uh, the strategic arms limitation talk agreement. I see that might be on the next slide. Um, uh, an important consideration is the difference between disarmament and arms control. The, orig the US originally tried with disarmament and proposed the Baruch plan. Baruch was a Wall Street financier who was asked by the Truman administration to speak at the United Nations and to propose that all sides would give up nuclear weapons. But the Soviets thought this was not desirable because they knew the US had them and the US Soviet Union didn't have them. And it would always cement this US in a position, Soviet Union in a position of inferiority. So the Soviets vetoed in the Security Council, the Brook Plan. There were some other efforts made in the 60s, including the Antarctic Treaty, which banned nuclear weapons of deployments in the Antarctic. In 1960, there was a very important meeting in Cambridge, Mass, to spell out the meaning of arms control. And Tom Schelling, a, a Nobel, ultimately a Nobel laureate in economics, someone who I knew very well, and Mort Halpern, a young, very smart defense analyst at the time, wrote a book, Strategy and Arms Control. And Schelling and Halpern defined arms control as any measure that would reduce the likelihood of war, reduce the damage should war occur, or reduce the preparation for war. There were later uh, examples of other uh, arms control measures, particularly with testing, the limited test ban treaty, which limited all testing to underground testing in 1963. The threshold test ban treaty, which limited the detonation of uh, weapons to 150 kilotons or less. And then, and th those both are in, in force. 
and then the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which was signed in 1996, but the U.S. has never become a party to it because they've never been able to obtain Senate ratification for the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Because it's not, of, oh, yes? sorry, uh, of course, sorry. Because of uh, Russia, because of Republican concerns that we would not be able to verify uh, low yield uh, Soviet tests. There's also a, a treaty uh, prohibiting nuclear weapons in outer space. Do we have another time for another uh, slide or that's it? Uh, we have one more slide, but uh, you can uh, continue next time. Okay. Yeah. Any questions or comments before we hang up? Is it clear, have I gone too rapidly over this or is it pretty straightforward? It's pretty good, straightforward. Okay, very good. Then we'll talk next time about the uh, SALT agreements right up through the New START agreement, which actually just was announced today by Secretary of State Blinken that the US and the, and the Russians have agreed to a five-year extension of New START. We'll talk about that next time. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you. This Monday, I think uh, Professor Bieber, uh, uh, so can uh, Professor Naka have uh, two more slides, then uh, can you move on to your lecture? I'm sorry, so what happens on Wednesday? So uh, next mon Monday, so oh. you, will, you, you, you will lecture uh, first, then uh, we'll move on to Professor Bieber. I see, okay. Where do we have class on Monday? Isn't it President's Day? Oh, oh sorry. Is it Monday or the week of Monday? Might be a week from Monday. Yeah, week, week from Monday. From, yeah. The February 15th is a present day. Yeah, so we have a regular class this Monday. Mm -hmm. Right.